Welcome everybody. I'm Jane Duncan, um, former president of the RIBA. I also run my own practice, architects and interior designers in Buckinghamshire, and they're a medium-sized practice. And I was vice president practice for six years. And today we're talking about a very important subject for all of our members, and that is the importance of having a contract with your client. And we're going to be looking today with a panel um, at the professional services contracts that apply to your projects, why we should use them and what's contained within them. So let me introduce the panel. Um, first of all, we have sitting on my left, Dieter Bentley Gottman from EPR Architects, who is the chair of our regulation and standards group. Uh, next to him we have Mark Klimt, partner at DWF LLP, who is an RIBA specialist practice consultant on contracts. Next to him is Nigel, our team from Hawkins Brown, who is the chair of the RIBA Client Liaison Group. And last but definitely not least, we have Barbara Kowski from Erect Architecture, who chairs the RIBA Small Practice Group. So let's start. The first question, guys, of course, is why do we as practitioners need to have a form of appointment? I think I might suggest that we ask Perhaps, Mark, if you would start us off with um, a legal perspective on why architects need appointments. Okay, well, from a legal perspective, um, if you think about the courts, uh, whenever there's a dispute, the starting point will be uh, what is the written agreement. So um, a written agreement is important. It's in the interests of certainty so that everybody knows what, every, what they're doing, what their duties are, what their obligations are, and what their rights are. Um, and I think the RIBA um, suite of documents has been put together um, with the benefit of accrued experience over previous um, uh, uh, documents and previous incarnations to try and get a balanced agreement so that everybody is, is if you like, happy and, and has their interests reflected. Um, because otherwise, if you're thrown back on just, well, what you think the parties intended, often a court will just um, uh, put into a contract the bare minimum to give the relationship what's called business efficacy, and that will not necessarily um, assist either party. Mm, I agree. But, um, Dieter, there is um, a current f um, code of conduct. There's a new one just about to come out. Um, which as a member, actually, we, we've signed up for this. Um, that also has a bearing, does it not, in Absolutely. the code? Yes, um, as architects, we've got a legal obligation to meet the Architects Act, which has the Architects Code. And like you say, as members, we're obliged to meet the RIBA Code of Professional Conduct. And both codes are quite clear and explicit mm. that we have a duty to have a written agreement in place with our clients, which make it quite clear what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, how we're going to be paid for it. So absolutely essential to meet those codes. And, and what we need is a, is a good code that's understandable by the practices and by their clients. Um, may, I might come to you, Barbara, next, because obviously there are a lot of small practices. 80% of the practices in the UK are small practices, and that's 10 people or less. So. The, the projects are ne of necessity going to be smaller. So why is it, do you think, particularly relevant for smaller practices to have an appointment? Is it necessary for everyone of their little jobs? Well, I can definitely understand why for small practices it can feel like it's too much, like we run very small projects. Often many of them, people ask themselves, is it really needed? I think the point to make would be it's especially needed because many of our clients are non-experts. Sort of, we work for homeowners, we work for domestic clients, we work for small businesses, we work for people for many of whom this will be the first um, architectural projects they have done in their lives or will ever do. And there, it is especially important for us as the expert, as the consultant, to take our clients through this journey, explain to them exactly what the what our duties are, what their duties are, take them through all the risks of the projects. And rather than sitting there for hours and 
taking them through all of that, the contract is actually a really good point by point, like a guiding tool nearly that we like to use in our practice to make sure we address everything and also to ensure we come to the most sticky and difficult points and make sure we educate our clients on those as well. So you don't find it too difficult for your clients to understand why there is an appointment document you're asking them to sign? No, I don't because when you explain to the clients what is involved in the project, then it actually puts you on a good footing where sort of we are the professionals. We explain to them, we teach them, we educate them, and they are actually grateful for that. And a bit of clarity can really help them. And clients might be scared, clients might be overwhelmed, but I think you can take them on this journey. What about the larger clients, Nigel? <clears throat> how, how do they see these forms of appointment? Are they a nuisance? Well, I mean, so, some will use them, some won't. Um, yes. I think, you know, fundamentally, if we're saying, why do we need a form of appointment? Um, the fact is that some things in life are pretty straightforward. If you ask someone to paint a fence, you don't really need a contract. But building contracts are fundamentally complicated, complex. So we need to have a way of setting down all the, all the key issues. From large, um, from clients' point of view, um, and you're asking about large, larger projects, um, to be honest, some of them won't be using uh, the RIBA standard form. They'll be using their own bespoke versions. Um, but we would always guide them to, um, to the sort of terms and conditions in, in the standard form because they are thorough, fundamentally well considered. So the, really, the, the answer is you still need an appointment? You absolutely need an appointment, yes, whatever you're doing. And uh, I, I have no idea. I only run a medium-sized practice myself, and I use the standard forms because I am not set up to be able to change to something else. But for a larger project, presumably, you need to have some help to make sure your appointment has all the terms in it that you need. Yeah, well so it's a, good, it's a good way to... So I'd spend quite a lot of my time looking at um, bespoke contracts for, for our projects that, that were sent. And it's a useful reference to be able to refer back to the standard form to say, what should we be looking for to be included in there? And a, a useful comparison. So. Yeah, at least from that point of view, they're, they're very valuable. But, uh, but actually, we'd always recommend to clients that they should be using the standard form because they have all sorts of advantages over a, over a bespoke one. So in, for any size of project, then? Very much. Any size of project, from smallest to the largest project, you should always have Absolutely. And contract. Absolutely. And there are a range, of course, which cover all the different sizes of contracts. Yeah, so we've got here... We've got a version for um, uh, the, the, the standard version, which is for the larger projects primarily. We've also got the concise version for smaller commercial projects. And we've got the domestic version. And uh, we've got also a sub-consultancy and a principal designer version. So we've got the complete suite there. Very good. And Very if we're just talking about the importance of having a contract, there are certain things, whatever size of, of project, there are certain things that everybody is going to be concerned with things like copyright, what happens to copyright, um, how much is it going to cost, uh, and if there's a dispute, how is it going to be resolved? And I think at least as important um, as putting in the appointment what will be done for an architect is to define what needs to be done by other people, what won't be covered, because an architect tends to be the sort of the default, if there's ever a gap the client will go back to the architect and say, well, what's happened here? What, why wasn't this dealt with? Mm -hmm. So a properly drafted appointment which sets out what needs to be dealt with elsewhere is, I think, very important. Yeah. Fundamentally, why. why do we need contracts? Because it's hellishly complicated. Yeah. And we've got to write this stuff down. We can't rely on word of mouth and trying to memorise it. You can't have a verbal contract for a building appointment. It's just too complicated. So maybe sort of a quick note on the sort of question of bespoke contracts, because even though we are a small practice, we are also, we have to deal with bespoke contracts because we work for public sector clients and they tend to have their own contracts. And we obviously can't afford a legal team or anything like that. Neither can we say no to these projects. So like you, of course, we try and push the REBA terms and conditions, uh, which is um, often futile. And what we have actually learned and what is good advice and what we didn't know from the beginning is that we can send these contracts to our insurance legal teams and free of charge, they actually make sure that they do not violate the terms and conditions of our PI insurance. And the most obvious thing to look out for is 
the reasonable in an architect has to provide reasonable duty and care, the reasonable gets dropped really, really often. And that is like an absolute, absolute terrible thing and definitely something to look out for. Gosh, it sounds ghastly, doesn't it? So, <laughs> I mean, it, it, the, the, the truth is, what we're talking about is a construction world that is a minefield and that these documents will help both the clients and mm. the, their architects through that minefield uh, with some considerable clarity, I'd say. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk about what the, the appointments actually do cover, what, what's, what's contained in them, what it is that we need to know is in there for both our, from our perspective and from the client's perspective. Um, Dieter, do you want to, to come in on this? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the codes of practice make it very clear that there's some essential terms that we should always be included in all our appointments. Mm -hmm. And obviously those are covered in, in these new documents. But it's looking specifically at what are you going to do? So what's the scope of your project? What is your client actually seeking for you to do? Is that achievable? How are you going to achieve it? So therefore, what's your scope of service? What's your fee going to be for providing that service? What's the programme? Is there any other specialist advice you need? Are there other consultants? As Mark mentioned, it's very clear to make sure our, our relationship with the rest of the design team is, is clear to everybody so we know what we're doing, but also the other consultants know what they're, what's expected of them. So design responsibilities matrix you know, can be vital to that and should be used as a management tool in conjunction with these documents. I, I think that, it's, that it is a very important point, this. I think it's a really important point about things like design responsibility. But actually, one of the things that we always emphasise is that um, what, what, this, what these standard forms provide is a, is a solid set of terms and conditions, but they also have uh, an extended scope of service that mm -hmm. the previous version had. And actually, for us architects, when we're checking the appointment, it's really the scope that we need to be checking. Um, the terms and conditions, hopefully, with the exception of maybe the payment clauses, we don't use. I mean, when things go bad, sometimes you do. But the fact is the scope is always relevant and we have to be very careful to make sure that we're not, that we fully understand what it is that we're signing up to do. So it's great to have an extended scope in these things because it gives you a lot, much greater clarity than, than I think we've had before. And also clarity for the client. Often we'll see lots of variation through the development of the project and the client just expects all that additional service to be included. But we need to say, well, here's the, this is where the the line is drawn and this is additional, this is additional service, additional fee. So you don't end up with scope creep and nobody understanding until the end and that's when the disputes arise. There, there is, I mean, there is uh, there's other legislation, isn't there, which, which, which pertains to these contracts, which we may not need to know too much about, but presumably the contracts are drafted to, to deal with them. Um, Mark, could you give us some oh, yes. I mean, indication on these? Like, well, for the domestic uh, project, you've yes. got to make sure that, uh, because it's quite a, a high hurdle to show that you've explained everything to your client, um, at, particularly as you are um, contracting on your own standard terms. So a court would always, if there's any ambiguity, a court would always construe it against the person whose standard terms they are, because the court will say, well, if you wanted it to say what you're trying to convince me, it should have said, you should have put that in. Um, so yes, there's, there's, there's a, a sort of a raft of consumer, uh, there's unfair contract terms, that's Consumer Rights Act, which have to be uh, complied with. Um, there's also a practical thing that you have to show uh, a, a higher standard that you've explained everything to your domestic client, gone through everything and they understand everything. but. On all contracts, for example, the um, Housing Grants Act, you've got to reflect the payment provisions in the Housing Grants Act and not have a, a pay when paid provision, for example, which would be outlawed. And also um, a raft of health and safety um, legislation, which needs to be reflected in the standard terms. Yes. So it's quite a complex picture, actually. Also yes, although the, the only thing is that I think you're right, basically, What's the spine of a contract? What, what do people want to know? They want to know what they're getting, what people will be doing, how much it's going to cost, what protections they have, so for example, what insurance does the uh, architect carry, and uh, uh, what can I do if it goes wrong? Mm. And if that, that's really, uh, and that everybody understands that. And then you're quite right. I think the scope of service is very important. Uh, we take a lot of trouble over drafting these contracts, but the most successful projects will be, once it's signed, 
It's never referred to. It's put away in the drawer, never referred to. The only thing that will be referred to is the scope of service. Mm. I have another concern, which is about um, fair and balanced contracts, uh, and that's come up several times during the course of the discussion. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask Nigel and then Barbara about this fair and balanced bit. If you have in front of you a set of contract documents for architects which are fair and balanced, we know that, and you're presented by your client with something else, how do you know that that's going to be as fair and balanced as these? Because it isn't just fair for the client, it's also fair for the architect, and the point is balance is what we're looking for. Mm, well, I suppose the issue is that both parties perhaps have a slightly different view of what's fair and what's balanced. <laughs> yes, um, sure you're Which right. is why we have lawyers, of course, um, because often there's disagreement over that. And I mean, one of the things that we have to do is, one of the things that the standard form has to do is to, to try and be as fair and balanced as possible, because if it's skewed too much to the architect, clients just won't use them. Um, so they want to see that there is some degree of fairness, but at the same time, we don't want something which is too biased towards the client and puts all the risk and liability onto us. So it has to be genuinely fair and balanced. And so these have been put together over quite a period of time, these standard forms. And a lot of that has been thinking about what is the, what is the right duty of care? How are we going to express the duty of care, um, for example? How are we going to express uh, the level of liability that, that the consultant will carry versus the, um, what the client might take? And it's, it's complicated. Um, and that's why it's better to leave some people who know what they're doing, putting these things together, rather than us as individuals trying to work it out as, as practitioners. Because whilst we might have a you know, pretty reasonable understanding of the law from, a, from an architectural practitioner's point of view, we don't have uh, the sort of thorough legal understanding that, uh, that the people who have written these questions. So I'm going to ask Barbara then if there's um, an issue. You mentioned that you, as a small practice, do public sector work and they're giving you their own contracts, how do you ensure that those are fair and balanced? Or do you just sign them anyway? Uh, no. <laughs> you do not just <laughs> sign them anyway. But it is really tricky. And we usually, I mean, to get a public sector contract, you go through a selection process mm. and you get selected for whatever a proposal you have made. So there is a certain buy-in from the client already, which gives us the confidence to actually go back to them and say, look, these contract clauses just really do not work. They are not fair. Our insurers, lawyers have flagged them up. They are flagged red. It's in no one's interest if we sign this and please amend them. Because also, I mean, it is also not in the interest because of, of course these bespoke contracts are biased. Towards, against us and towards the clients. That's why they are bespoke contracts that sort of public sector local authorities put forward. But, um, but it's not in the client's interest either if our insurance says, well, they will actually just not cover us. Absolutely. I think the point is that we have to negotiate. This is the thing. And I think sometimes architects have perhaps been guilty in the past of being, taking what they've been given, saying, well, I feel like I have to sign this. But actually, I think we'd encourage people always to look carefully at the terms and conditions um, ideally, get your insurers, as you say. Most insurers would give, a, give some free advice, legal advisors, if you can afford them, um, to have a look through and, and, and check it. And then go back and, and have a go at negotiating. Well, based, on, based on the fact that we already have forms of appointment which are fair and balanced, we really have a good, good starting point for that dis we have. discussion and negotiation, don't we? We also have a responsibility under the code that says if we're not able to deliver something, we need to make sure the client's aware of that. And so I think with these bespoke forms of point where there is a lot of transfer risk upon us, if we're not able to manage that risk, we have a responsibility to say to the clients, we cannot do this. And I agree with you, Barbara, it's in their best interest. There's no point in signing up to something if we can't do it, because ultimately the client loses, particularly if there is a claim and we're not insured. Mm. But what I we've think. been talking about now is that sometimes you're saying that architects feel under pressure sign and, and very often that pressure is because they're already part of the way into the project and a client will say well sorry look un unless you've signed up to this I can't uh, my my uh, accounts department won't let me process your <laughs> fee so that actually is a very good practical reason uh, 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 and argument for having these appointments in place from the beginning so no, that certainly aside is. from a legal there's a practical 
benefit to uh, mm -hmm. architects in having that from day one. And on Nigel's point of negotiation, I would say really negotiate everything, not just the fee, actually also negotiate the limit of your um, liability as hard. Mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of important to know from a small practice perspective, again, just talk to the insurers and get them to send you customized um, you know, verification certificates for any limit you want, really. I mean, you might hold higher PI than you're offering, which, and really try and keep it low. As low as is obviously fair and reasonable, but don't over-provide. That's a, that's a good piece of advice. Um, the insurers like it. What, it helps what, what, keeps premium what about low as the, well. um, the opportunity, which is now in the, in the paperwork here, for the architect to do the, the um, principal designer role, does, does that have any um, impact on this fair and balanced contract? I think certainly we need to make sure where we're providing principal design and services, we definitely have the contract in place. There's a legal obligation under the CDM regulations yeah. to make sure that appointment's confirmed in writing. Um, we also need to be aware of the duties under the CDM regs when we're talking about the duties to do what we can so far as reasonably practical. So again, yes. we need to make sure that's reflected in the contract so we don't then end up raising the bar, particularly when we're talking about health and safety issues, where the repercussions can be so serious. I think there's, there's another, there are a number of reasons why it's important to have a separate appointment, and there is a separate appointment yes. in these standard forms for principal designer. One of those is that um, the, the services might be of a different duration. So you might well be the architect from inception through to completion, but you yes. might be the principal designer, perhaps only up until the point when the principal contractor comes on board, which is certainly something mm. we look to do these days, we think the principal contractor is in a better position to perform the principal designer role um, in most cases. So, um, so that, that allows that differential um, between the two, two roles to be expressed. And the other thing, of course, is that, and I think this is probably true more for smaller projects, from my understanding, than for larger projects, that clients might expect the principal designer role to be just thrown in as, a, as an individual yeah. service. Mm, yes. And um, so having a separate appointment does give you the means to, to explain that actually it is, an, a, a, it is a separate role. It is, it is a role that is fundamentally best performed by the architect as lead designer, but nonetheless it is a separate role and it gives you the ability to have that conversation, explain the, 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 what the role involves and why it's important that the client has duties under mm -hmm. the uh, CDM regulations as well, but that we can negotiate a separate fee for it. Very important then. What are the architect's main responsibilities under this appointment? Um, really important question, and, and I'm sure everybody wants to come in on this one. Um, well, let's start at this end. Let, let's see what <laughs> Dieter has to say. Um, the, the new documents obviously enshrine what's in the code. So there is, as we've discussed, the reasonable skill and care obligation. So that's care to your clients, care to the rest of the team, and making sure you're discharging your duties properly. Um, it's making sure you're meeting the obligations to inform your client about what you will, and most importantly, what you won't be doing mm -hmm. as well. So bearing in mind that you don't include in the appointment what you're not going to be delivering. So you've got that clear scope of services we've discussed, we've got the fee, we've got the programme, and the certainty that everyone can rely on, this is what's going to happen. Um, I'm going to ask a question which ma m perhaps Mark hadn't anticipated. Um, yes, we know there's a duty of care and a duty to inform. Um, what happens if everything changes during the course of the contract and your duty of care suddenly expands or the information becomes very difficult, uh, very, very uh, convoluted? Uh, by other parties. Um, what is your duty then? Well, I think it, the starting point as you said, is the duty of care. Um, and, that, and, and from an insurance perspective as well, I, insurers would want to know that the architect has signed up to um, perform uh, to a standard that can be subject to an objective test. And if you've established that objective test, um, and the objective test really is what would a representative body of your fellow professionals have done in those circumstances. So once you've got that objective test, in a way, if the circumstances change, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it, well, I mean, it obviously matters in a practical sense, yes. your, your response to it, but, but the, the, uh, what's expected of you is a constant, which is that you've got to 
respond in a way that is appropriate and objectively appropriate in the changing circumstances. Um, I, I wonder, Barbara, whether all sm small practitioners will understand this, will understand what the duty of care actually is to a client. Duty to inform is perhaps a little easier to understand, hmm. but um, what, what about the, this duty to inform? Do, do, do architect, the small practices know that well enough to take that as read, but perhaps not the duty of care? What is your thought? I think both have their pitfalls, don't they? If you work with very inexperienced clients, it can sometimes be just on a personal level quite difficult to break them, the sometimes inconvenient or even disturbing truth where the project is going or what well, their wishes might entail. But I think that's the reality of our role as professionals. Well, mo most domestic clients undertake projects with architects very, very, in, well, in some cases, only once in their life. But That's right. Um, and always very emotionally involved. Yes, and it's their home. And one of the things I do enjoy about um, the new contracts is that there are sort of separate headings in them for the brief, the program, and the construction cost. Because I think these are three things that have to be clear at the beginning of a project, but very often are not. And we encounter clients who are either, either they really don't know how much money they want to put into this project, or they are really cagey about it because they somehow feel if they don't reveal, they might get a better deal. And it's just unbelievable the kind of conversation we have around these points, but it's in the contract. This conversation must be had. We need to know what the construction cost is we are working to. And if we don't know, then we can say, okay, we don't know, so we have to do a feasibility study. Please, this is the scope for our feasibility so study, the and these are our fees for the feasibility so it's study. It's a checklist. It's really, really helpful um, because without this knowledge, we cannot do a good job. Very good. Nice. I think this might be a good opportunity to put a little plug in for the RIBA's briefing toolkit because, Go on then. Um, because <laughs> this, this, the, the, the contract works, is, is designed to work with the contract, but the briefing toolkit uh, encourages the client and the architect to make sure they've got an understanding of, of obviously the scope, uh, the cost of the building. Um, you know, how many times, but I, I'm guessing particularly on smaller projects, but also on larger projects, not have that great deal of certainty about the, the outturn cost of the project. And for smaller projects, thinking about things like, it, will there be VAT to pay? Is there a sudden, um, you know, sudden jump in the cost that I just hadn't reckoned with in my, you know, as a client in my calculations? Have I accounted for, actually, for the cost of the fees, the professional fees that I'm going to pay, not just the architect, but potentially others? And for things like statutory, uh, statutory regulations and so on, planning and building regulations. So the briefing toolkit is something which, uh, which is free to download for charter members, and I think it's the sort of thing which, should, which works really well with these appointments. Thanks very much, RIBA. E e excellent bit of information there. I'll uh, just come back to the duty of care. I, would, I was hoping you were going to question. come back to it. <laughs> because I think one thing we have to be very careful of as architects is in our enthusiasm to win work and in our enthusiasm <laughs> to seduce clients, there is a danger we oversell ourselves. And through that, there can be a risk that we raise that bar and that duty of care. As Mark was explaining, we, we get judged on the duty of care by the standard that the other architects are performing at. If we then say, well, we're experts at this, and we specialise in this, you're suddenly raising yourself above the standard level to then a specialist level. And in our enthusiasm, say, I'm the best, you want to employ me, you can inadvertently raise that duty of care. So you have to be very careful with that, and particularly how you then enshrine what you do in your contract to make sure you don't do that inadvertently. Mm. I think in there's fact, another point which... No, no, sorry. Go <laughs> um, because the contract says it, it compares your duty of care with other people who work in the same field, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think this could be construed by 
well, this is really a huge obstacle for, obstacle for us to break into a new sector, to do something we haven't done before, but it doesn't have to be. All it means that if we want to break into a new sector, do something that we haven't done before, we just have to put the extra time in and the extra legwork and the extra research to make sure we can perform this task as well as someone who has done it before. I think that's all. This well, or clause collab means. collaborate with another or practice collaborate that already with has someone that skill else. That you yeah. can, uh, But you somehow can make sure you can raise your skill level to the level of the general field who have done this kind of work Pres before. Presumably, though, for small practices, they won't be able to offer every service that every job's going to require. No, of Whether course it's not. within their, so it's their experience work. or not. So, uh, presumably, they will then go out and get that experience and bring it in to the team. Yeah. But providing they've told the client that's what they're going to do, that's their duty of care covered, is it not? Absolutely. There we go. I mean, sp spookily, that's what I was, I was going to say. <laughs> to say <sort> of <laughs> but, and actually, that, that, that's, I think, an advantage of the, uh, the, 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 the recent RIBA terms because there's, there is a difference between sort of like the median duty of care where you're judged against the profession and then a slightly enhanced duty of care where you're judged against members of your profession who are experienced in jobs of a similar size, scope and complexity. But in practical terms, if you are trying to break into that, you wouldn't be able to sort of pull it back to the sort of median. You wouldn't say to a client, well, I've never done anything like this before, but I'll have a, I'll have a bash, you know, <laughs> because they're not going to engage you. And I think the RIBA terms recognise that because most, I'm sure you've seen this as well, most bespoke terms will have the slightly enhanced yeah. objective Might test. All yes, the, uh, and, and, and that your experience, that yeah. you're that you'll be compared with people who have the requisite experience, and a client is expect is entitled to expect that the professional they've engaged has got the requisite experience. And the newer terms do actually say they they, they enshrine that duty of care, so there's not a, a disparity. And I think that's quite right. That that, that, that that's practical and helpful. Very good. Probably the number one issue for small practices, if not for every single practice, is how do you set the fees? It, fees are a major issue, strangely enough, for architects. Um, and, and I'd say particularly for smaller practices and sole practitioners. Um, so I'm going to come straight to you, Barbara, and ask you, um, how do you think that these new contracts um, help with architects, particularly smaller practices, how do you think that this deals with setting out the fees? Does it help? Yes, I do like it. I like how it's more broken down. So I think especially the online tool is great and you can essentially really very clearly set out your scope, including how many meetings you're going to do at what work stage how many meetings you're going to do while it's on site. You can link it to a program. So you can, the contract really supports the architect in creating a very clear picture. Obviously, the architect has to then also take the opportunity to create a very clear picture, which is just quite a bit of work. And it's, I would say, from our practice experience, not something we would have been able to do when we started out. I think when we started out, we were very much relying on sort of percentage rates, you know, with slightly underbidding, that kind of thing. But over the years, we have gathered enough data through timesheets and monitoring of profits and all of these things that uh, one should ideally do or should really reasonably do or absolutely do, um, that we are now able to bid for our projects in a very broken down way using resource schedules. That makes it just incredibly transparent what we are going to do and how much we are going to charge for it. I'm and the contract helps. I think that I'm going to come to you, Nigel. Well, I was going to say... Uh, I think, on, from, um, from a client perspective, presumably, the transparency that this offers is extremely useful. Yeah, well, OK. So from a client point of view, so you mentioned at the beginning that I chair the client liaison group here, which is fundamentally a group that we put together at the RIVA about five years ago to help us as practitioners understand what it is that clients want from us as architects. Yes. And one of the things that comes across, there are many things, one of the things that comes across loud and clear is they want professionalism. And so, um, and, and I think to me that means that it's perhaps sometimes saying things which we feel are maybe not what they want to hear, but nonetheless it's the, it's the, it's a, you know, it's the medicine that they need to, need to swallow. 
And, um, and so if that's explaining in more detail um, about the scope and, uh, and the fee and so on, then I think we should. So, um, so clients want us to be professional. They want us to, um, they fundamentally want us to understand um, contra contracts and, uh, and how that mechanism works. They don't want us to, uh, uh, to sort of try and push it to one side. So they do want that and they do want us to understand the cost, what it costs us to do the work. Um, rather than uh, second guessing. Um, Dieter, from the sort of larger uh, practitioner's perspective, um, well, we've heard from a small pr small practitioner's perspective that this makes life a lot easier. H how do you, how, how do you feel this works for the larger project in terms of setting fees? Well, it, actually, I think it's it's very similar. I agree that to try and set a fee just based on a construction value is a very naive approach. Yes. It doesn't allow you to manage the project well. Variations in construction value don't necessarily relate to the variations in your service. So actually looking at project complexity, what level of resource you're going to be providing, mm. what level of service you're going to be providing, and tying your feedback to that is far more useful. And like we were discussing earlier, then setting that down in your appointment so it's all scheduled out. As soon as there's variations, you can allow for those. You can then charge the additional fee for those variations. So it's a far more, I hesitate to use the word, scientific approach, but it's a more robust approach to setting your fee calculation. And it's a more professional approach, I'd argue. Absolutely, I'd argue. yes. But from and there's also yeah. greater likelihood that the client will be prepared to, you know, not happily, but not grudgingly pay you additional fees because they, they will understand. actually understand what they're yeah. getting for it. Whereas if your fee increases are linked to increases on construction costs, like you say, I mean, the client will just feel ripped off for want of a better word because not only do they have to pay more for their project, but they also yeah. have to pay more for their consultant and why. Uh, yeah, the example I always use is taps. If you have a standard tap, a low construction value, change those to gold taps, your construction value goes up. It doesn't involve us doing any more work why would we get additional fee? But if you change the whole bathroom and then you've got more taps, you know, more specification, there's more work, there's more service, therefore additional fee. You're actually, I think, asking through these contracts for architects to consider their fees rather than put a, if you like, a pin in a graph like, as we used to do 20 years ago and say, oh, well, it's X percentage. I mean, from my perspective, and I run medium-sized practice, we absolutely have to consider uh, our fees at each level because it's so complicated now. Everything, even planning services, if we only have to do those, there are a myriad of different things we have to do now. It's so different from 20 years ago, and every project has different things. It's almost a bespoke contract for every project, from our perspective. And also you can't guarantee in perhaps the way we could traditionally of knowing that when you join a project early and get planning that you're going to be retained mm. right through to completion. So you need to know that your fee is balanced for the, the particular stage of service that you might be delivering. So you can't be front-loading, back-loading, playing clever games because either you end up overcharging or worse, you end up undercharging and you make a loss. Yes, well, we don't we don't want that now, do we? Uh, from from a legal perspective, Mark, how how can clients in particular feel that they can rely on this in terms of architects' fees? Now, is this I mean, is, is a, this is a, this better a, from that perspective? It is a problem. It's um, always a problem. It, fees are, fees are going to be a problem, and I think one has <laughs> to sort of accept that there's that there's there's any number of complications as far as the fees are concerned. Because, mm -hmm. for example, if you you charge up to stage whatever it is a certain fee there'll be disputes as to whether that stage was completed or whether you sort of like seeped into the next stage and and so that that would be a, a dispute um, and also if you like redoing particularly on domestic projects do clients understand that when they get a little bit enthusiastic and think well can we just change this and can we just change that 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 um, uh, uh, attracts an additional fee and I think there are ways obviously of 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 trying to uh, to get around that you can for example build in a percentage of abortive work or or repetitive work and then say if it goes above that then that's an additional fee but the key thing is it's just common sense it's tr try and be as clear and as simple as possible and 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 
for it to be, as you say, transparent and uh, what you're charging and what's going to be additional. There will always be arguments, but that way you try and reduce the arguments. We, we were touching on the... Sorry, Barbara. We were touching on the duty to inform yes. earlier on. And I think it's fundamental about contracts. They Fundamentally, they inform, don't they? They set out in fine detail what we're going to do and give us a good understanding between... Um, practitioner and client of what's going to happen and how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take. Um, and uh, and that, that's a fundamental requirement. One of the um, issues that you picked up, I think, Barbara, that I think was ex extremely relevant is not just the transparency of your fees, but actually being able to think about them in advance. And in our practice, we also do resource planning for, for the stages of work. So we have quite a lot of work in, in our office before we even go to the client with the fee proposal to actually look at the project so that we know that we can justify what it is that we're doing in setting out the fees. And then we give them this resource plan. Actually, we're very open with it, particularly for construction drawings. And we say, OK, here is our list of construction drawings. We need X meetings. We need X amount of time for checking and for coordination, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And you send it to them, and if they argue and they want the fee low, you say, what do you not want? And we don't say, oh, well, we're going to cut the fee by 20% because you don't like it. We say, this is how long it's going to take to do your project. It's very open, and it's very honest. And I, I think hiding behind a percentage fee is not open and not honest, and presumably something that legally is very much more difficult to justify when things change. Yeah. I mean, also... I guess we do not charge additional fees for every scope change and so on because you know we also have to manage our client relationships we want to keep the client happy etc and I think I like your idea of a percentage rate for both of work but what we actually do do is we tell the client very clearly that we are going to make this change they have requested it and we are going to make it out of goodwill without increasing our fee so because that's just how it is and they need to know and that is an understanding that you know the next time they make a change we will charge it's all about a good relationship it's all about you know managing the relationship in a good way but also just you know we are the professionals that is a we are and proud of our code has the overarching duty to make sure we are adequately resourcing our projects and we do have the capability to deliver them and how do you know that if you don't do this groundwork in the first place? Yes, that's basically it. We've got to do our groundwork. We really do have to do our groundwork. Right, so what we're going to talk about now is liabilities. And um, obviously it's a key concern for architects. So I'm going, to ask, I'm going to start by asking Mark, who's our legal brain, about the position on liabilities. And, um, and how does these, this set of contracts, how, do that, how does that deal with the architect's liabilities? Well, we spoke a little bit earlier about the duty of care. Yes. And that does underpin, uh, and I also mentioned from the insurance angle, um, uh, because insurers uh, will offer protection for wrongdoing. For, for th they'll have assessed the risk that they, that they are insuring. And so the key is um, not to promise to do anything that you can't deliver and not to promise that something will be achieved that is outside your control. And that's what the duty of care, uh, as defined in each of the RIBA um, uh, speech documents, does underpin. It says that the services, that, the, that it, it makes it quite clear that the architect will perform their uh, duties um, exercising the skill, care and diligence reasonably to be expected of uh, a member of the profession who has the requisite experience. Um, diligence was added. It used to be reasonable skill and care. Diligence was added, I think, um, two standard forms ago, or, or the last standard form, in um, uh, recognition of the fact that that doesn't. This case law shows that that doesn't actually enhance. You, 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 know, you can't really picture somebody standing up in court and saying, "Well, I only needed to be reasonable and careful, reasonably uh, skillful and careful, and didn't have to be diligent." It's not really going. <laughs> Um, oh I think there is case law to show that if you say all reasonable uh, skill and care, that is somewhat enhanced and that raises your obligation. But again, that is, I would say, sort of dancing on a, a pinhead. I think that, that basically 
it's accepted now through the RIBA terms, reasonable skill, care and diligence um, uh, is, underpins everything that the architect does. And um, particularly where th th I think there is also a clause which says that certain things can't be guaranteed, that you can't guarantee that the budget is going to be met or that uh, planning permission will be obtained. These are things that are outside uh, the control of the architect or are only part of the architect's um, responsibility. They will be dependent on other factors. I think, I think it's true that we can't necessarily guarantee that the budget will be met, but we clearly have a very firm duty to, a fiduciary duty to the client to manage the budget. Yes, I mean, I mean, actually, just coming in there, very often in that discussion between client and, and architect, the client will say, well, the, the, the cost is very important to us. We've got to be, have that certainty. And the architect is not saying that uh, simply by just saying we'll exercise reasonable skill and care to achieve that, that they can sort of go off on you know, Brighton Beach with a, a deck chair and sort of forget about the, the, the budget. That skill and care does carry with it a responsibility to have proper regard for all things that are going to be important to a project. But, uh, but you can't guarantee it in the same way as a, a, a clause which says time is of the essence. Well, yes, time might be of the essence, but it has to be clear that the architect will have proper regard in those circumstances, but can't guarantee that the programme will be met. I, I noticed something, perhaps you could um, come back to me on it, and that's about the net contribution, because um, that's been reintroduced here. Yes. Uh, could, could you uh, just explain well, net what that means for architects. Yeah, and, and, and the net contribution clause is a good example of what you were talking about, whether you know, what's fair and reasonable depends on you know, are you buying or selling. Because a net contribution clause um, basically says that um, if, say, the architect shares um, liability, shares culpability with another party or two parties, that um, the architect, contrary to common law, which is joint and several liability. So the law will think that if there are three people who are responsible for a, uh, a loss, all of them are responsible for the whole loss. So that if two out of those three parties are no longer around, a client can enforce the whole of its loss against the remaining party. A net contribution clause, uh, such as there is in the RIBA terms, uh, goes against that and says no, the architect will only be responsible for that part of the loss that it's fair and reasonable for it to bear, having regard to its responsibility for it and on the basis that all the other parties who are responsible have paid out their fair and equitable share, regardless of whether they have actually done that. It's a deemed provision. Now, a client will say, um, why should I contract out of the law of the land? That's not, you know, if that's, you know, that's the way it is. Meanwhile, the architect will say, uh, no, uh, it's not fair that we should pick up the whole tab and we are not in as good a position as you, the client, to make sure that the people that you engage when the project is set up are of a proper standing who will still be there if there is a problem. So it's a, it's a case of, uh, of, of, uh, sort of negotiation. And it's back in the domestic um, appointment. There was concern that a net contributions clause might fall foul of consumer protection legislation, precisely because it does contract out of the law of the land. But there was case law, um, recent case law, where um, comments by the judge um, basically said that uh, uh, he disallowed that particular uh, net contributions clause, but his comments made it clear that a properly drafted net contributions clause, such as I think does appear in the uh, RIBA domestic standards, would have been upheld, and so that's why it's back in. Very good, Mark Nigel. This is not obviously the same when the architect is employing other consultants as subconsultants, and no. we've now got a specific form uh, for <laughs> subconsultants, which uh, which I think is a great great thing to have because increasingly, as architects, we are being asked by our clients to be that single point of responsibility, yeah. so they don't have to have uh, a range of separate professional services appointments with the architect, with the engineer, with the other consultants. Mm. They have a single point of contact and, and increasingly um, we're finding that that's, that's a role that the architect as lead designer is being asked to take on. So it's useful to have a standard form to, uh, to help manage that. In, a, a standard subconsultancy? Yeah. Yeah, because what, what's very important there from an insurance perspective, 
in, uh, uh, insurers need to um, sort of take on board the fact that their insured architect is going to assume this primary liability, so be responsible for all the services. And one of the, uh, uh, one of the conditions that insurers will, and the main condition insurers will impose, will be, will make sure that you've got a properly back-to-back -back agreement with your subconsultants. So there's no daylight between the duties that you as architect owe to the client and the duties that are owed to you by the subconsultant. And, and you were talking about how sometimes we can be on the back foot if we've started performing the services and we're still negotiating. Uh, well, that's doubly so with subconsultants, in, in my experience. You, you, and to have a standard form to allow you to get that done uh, rather more quickly is... Uh, yeah, and, and actually, make one more point on that. that, that there's always this... Um, if the architect is the lead consultant, the head consultant, there's always this friction. Well, do I involve the subconsultants in the negotiations of the prime agreement with the client? Because otherwise, I run the risk. If I finalise the head agreement, I run the risk that the subconsultants won't sign up to it. So, do I involve them? On the other hand, if I involve them, they're going to make all sorts of annoying points, and they don't have the responsibility to preserve that relationship with the client. They'll just give me a whole host of points that I need to make, and what do I do with them? But of course, if you've got a fair standard form, yeah. then all of that falls away. That's right. Well, that, that, Aha. Yeah. Uh -huh. We have the solution. Yeah, we've got <laughs> Can I ask you something that we often come up with, with this sort of appointment of subconsultants, is the, the limit of insurance? Because our insurance, because our scope of service is quite large, so the insurance has to be reasonably large. Often a subconsultant's scope of services is much smaller, and therefore they want to come in with a much lower insurance value. So is there a requirement or advice for that to be perfectly pack to pack? Uh, I think the, the answer there is that the practice that the architect would need to check with its insurance, uh, with what its insurance requirements are. Insurers used to be, I think, less imaginative and flexible. They used simply to say, no, it has to be, if you've got to maintain five million, then your subconsultant has to have five million and just keep it like that. But that is not actually necessarily realistic because it may be quite reasonable for a, 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 a lead consultant who's got a central role to have insurance at a particular level. But if you're going to a specialist subconsultant where it's actually not common to have that level of insurance or reasonable, um, you can't expect it. And the alternative, if, if insurers are simply going to say, no, 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 they must have that level, then the poor old subconsultant is simply going to say, well, sorry, I can't mm. do the job. In which case, the consultant, the architect, has to do it themselves, and that increases the risk to insurers. So I think insurers these days are a bit more flexible, but it needs to be checked. And th I think they'll generally say, do what's reasonable, see what's, it, what's a reasonable level, um, having regard to the, the, the lumber that their <laughs> mishaps can put you in, and also having regard to what's normal in the subconsultant's profession. You do hit that in your practice, Peter? In what respect? Sorry. Well, with, you must have a lot of sub-consultants sub on your, on your, on your um, projects, which you do. It's, we, we try to avoid it because of many of the issues being discussed here, but I think what we have to be careful of is being a large practice with more complex projects. Yes. And often we are appointed as the lead designer that there's a misconception by clients that, that means we are lead consultant and that we will be responsible for those other consultants. Um, so from my perspective, the net contribution clause in the appointment is, you know, absolutely top dollar because it does mean that we're not taking on that liability through the common law joint and several liability. Mm. But what I think we have to be careful of is that we don't end up assuming that liability. I think as architects, we love to solve problems and we hate a vacuum and we do all these great things with our appointments and we set down the boundaries, we get our design responsibilities matrix, we say this is what we're going to do, this is what the other consultants are going to do, then the other consultants don't perform. We want to keep the job going, we want to keep the client happy yes. and we say, well, we'll just do this and we'll just do that and suddenly we're taking on liability that we've not been appointed to take on and we're assuming those responsibilities. And I, th I think the other thing to that is to make sure that the, the project architect mm -hmm. and the, the team understand what's in the appointment. Absolutely. To some extent the terms and conditions, as we've said, a lot of the time you know, we don't have to have day-to-day -day regard to those, but they do nonetheless have to understand them, but particularly the scope of work. Mm -hmm. They've got to know 
what it is, and, and they might not, particularly in a larger practice where perhaps the negotiation of the appointments is done um, in one part of the practice and the delivery of the project is done in another. It's very important that that, that project architect and their team understand what's in the contract. There, there is an issue, of course, with expecting your team to understand all of this stuff, particularly if they're not... Um, RIBA trained or well, part they're all three qualified or architects, aren't they? Not necessarily. So, Not necessarily. I mean, like, but the the point is actually being able to find the right words to explain what their duties are, not to, uh, and, and be very clear about what they're not to do. Absolutely. But we have a duty as the qualified architects and the charter members to make sure that all our staff are under appropriate supervision. And Absolutely. that puts a responsibility on us to make sure the less experienced staff and the students that are training understand all of these issues as well as the day-to-day -day design and project delivery. It's a, it's a big ask, isn't it? it I, I think not so much, not, not so much from the, the chartered architect's perspective, but it might be a big architect for somebody who, let's say you've got an architect that has a big project team and to say your team needs to be aware of, of the boundaries. Um, it, is an, it is an added requirement. I don't think it's a bad it's, thing, but we have to be aware that you've got to do that now. But I also think in the long run, it makes our jobs easier because it means yes. you know from day one what you're doing, you know what the other consultants should be doing, and therefore you've got clarity. So if something does go, start to go slightly off, you can address it straight away rather than leaving things to tumble and get worse. Could you take us through sort of what we should be doing as architects in understanding our duties when it comes to these forms of appointment and when things go wrong, what should we do? Okay. Um, well, I think the, the, the code of conduct should be in everybody's mind at all stages when there's a dispute yes. because particularly... Uh, I mean, disputes uh, and on domestic projects in particular and the smaller ones, they, they can become really quite uh, frenzied and, and both sides very personal. The client, if it's their home, will feel let down if the project has gone into a you know, meltdown and an architect will probably feel betrayed thinking about all the extra hours, the late night phone calls that they've had and the extra work that they've put in and it's come to this. So it's a very volatile a situation anyway. So I think um, it's a good idea to try and take... One way of taking the heat out of it is to propose a, an early meeting between people who are informed on the project, so people who are involved, but also senior people who weren't involved in the project, so to take, so to depersonalise it to a degree. That's not so easy on a domestic uh, contract, much more easy on a commercial one, but to have people who can make decisions and can sort of see, hear the other side's argument. Um, and um, there's a provision for mediation and alternative dispute, all types of alternative dispute resolution, which the insurance industry was at the forefront of, but the courts are now building into their directions. They want to know that the parties have explored uh, the possibility of a mediated resolution. Um, there is adjudication, which is something of a, a, a double-edged sword. It's, in theory, a relatively cost-effective and time-effective way of resolving disputes because it's all got to be completed within either 28 or 42 days unless both sides agree a longer period. So, and where it's of limited time, it's also of limited uh, uh, cost, as I say. But uh, whilst it's enforceable, it's not necessarily the end of the story, and if somebody feels that they've been on the, 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 the wrong end of rough justice, they can still take it further to the ultimate dispute resolution um, uh, uh, possibility. Um, in practice, I don't think many people do do that because they feel, well, this is what the first independent party has thought of my case, so you know, I'm already 30 or 40 love down. But there is a possibility, and... Um, that whilst adjudication was introduced to keep a project going, more and more we're seeing that adjudication is being used by one party as some sort of ambush at the end of a project where the, that party has been sort of loading up this huge cudgel which they then bring down to, and, and it's a smash and grab 
raid and the other party then has a very limited period of time in which to respond. So for that reason, it's possibly more likely that the party on the receiving end will still refer it on, in which case all you've done is added an extra tier of cost to dispute resolution. And ultimately, there is uh, the courts or um, arbitration. Both of them have their advantages and disadvantages. In court, um, you can join, if you think other parties are responsible, you can join those parties. Um, also, the courts are now a lot more interventionist, so they can direct and they case manage um, a lot more than they used to, um, whereas arbitrators are rather scared of being appealed and so they tend to let things roll a little bit. Um, on the other hand, arbitration is confidential and that might be important to architects not wanting to have the publicity of a dispute uh, uh, emblazoned in the uh, legal and, and other press. Um, and if you do start, um, uh, whether it's arbitration or litigation, it's important to remember that along the way there are stages where you can interrupt it. You can still propose some sort of alternative. Not least of which, to my mind, is to avoid getting anywhere close to that in the first place. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things we talk again, we talk about the duty to inform. I think as long as we are keeping a dialogue going with the client throughout the um, course of the contract, you should largely be able to avoid these sort of issues arising in the first place because I think most of the time they come from misunderstanding or, or lack of, um, of information being provided. So as long as we carry on having a conversation with the client, which in my mind is the only way to get a good building anyway, mm -hmm. what building has ever come from a, um, from a, a poor relationship between client and architect? Um, so we have the, 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 the basis of that relationship through the appointment, but quite honestly, if ever we get any issues, we, I think our first job is to sort them out in the best way that we can yeah. and never let it get that far. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to then ask Dieter and Barbara to come in on this. Do you, within your practices, have a standard sort of complaints procedure. If someone, one of your clients puts in some form of complaint or is very unhappy about something, how is that dealt with? Let's, let's start with yeah. you, Dieter. I would, I would agree with Nigel that communication is key. Um, agreeing and setting up with your client right from the outset, as these um, service contracts do say, there is this dispute mechanism. Mm. But then don't just ignore it. If something goes wrong, kick that into action straight away. Make sure you talk about it. I think first and foremost, acknowledge to yourself that something has gone wrong and talk to your colleagues. I think the worst thing we can do is try and push it under the carpet, hope it'll go away, put it in the too difficult to deal with box. Yes. So we, our procedure is to make sure that there is somebody in the practice, actually myself, <laughs> That anybody can so you go know, to you know about at any me. point, absolutely. Um, so anybody can come to me and talk to me about anything that they're concerned about on their project. Straight away, we can start to flesh these things out. And as Nigel says, we can then go back to the client and say, well, we've identified this, this is a way of resolving it. If that is, doesn't work and it does actually manifest itself in an actual complaint, then again, that comes to me. I can act independently from the project team, so the project can carry on, I can deal with the complaint, I will then communicate with insurers. Mm. So again, communicating, they can then assist me and help, and hopefully resolve the problem. Um, but it, it's communication every step, making sure people keep talking. Well, that, that's a good message, isn't it, the communication? But of course, within a larger practice, you will have somebody else you can yes, go to. We have what, happens, what happens within a small practice? Unfortunately, because we are a small practice, we do not have this beautifully competent data in-house, even though we would love to. But what we do have is we have a very close-knit team and we are very careful to make sure that our team trusts us, that we will support them rather than being scared of us. So we encourage them to come to us the moment there are difficulties on a job. And as the directors, we see our role as teaching and supporting and that helps us then to you know gain the overview and seek communication with the client at the earliest possible point I mean like Nisha said it's all about communication and looking at it from the outside and trying to resolve the matter in an amicable way. 
something that I would also encourage small practices, and particularly sole practitioners, is establish a network of other architects because they may be able to assist. So if a complaint arises or a problem arises, you do have other people that you can go to. They may be outside of your practice, but at least the network's there, and it may be that they'll be able to support you through that process. Mm. Well, you, you might be able to do that um, through your local branch or regional office if Absolutely. you haven't got that network set up. Um, the RIBA is structured to give local advice. I think for small practices, disputes are a problem. The, the, I mean, as long as there's more than one of you, you could, because the, 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 I think when a dispute arises, it's very important for to actually sort of take a, a dispassionate look at where the weak points are in the project. You can do that in a large practice by referring it to a, 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 to a detail. Or <laughs> and in a smaller practice, if you've got somebody else, yeah. who you can say, look, have a look at this and see. And that will then often inform how, you, how robust you are to the client. Because sometimes, I mean, I, I know you're absolutely right, you have to have, keep the dialogue going. But if a client is trying it on, you've got to set your boundaries. Mm -hmm. But as long as you've got somebody else to talk to. But I think it's a real problem where you are a one-person outfit mm. and you're under pressure, you're tr you, you have been too helpful, you then fall in short, the client is bullying you, and it can, you know, your stress levels are up and there's really nowhere for you to, to turn. And, it, and yeah. it can get bigger and bigger and become a real problem. And I think there should be some sort of forum or, or, or there should be some... Uh, I mean, the RIBA helpline is one... Uh, uh, Absolutely, that, that, and that, that's how I know about it. Because that, I get a lot that's of what you're there for. Yeah, but yeah. but I think it is a big problem uh, when a dispute arises, having being able to put some sort of buffer, some sort of distance to look at it objectively, and then take the appropriate action to try. I agree with you. I, I shouldn't say I'm doing myself out of business, but I would keep uh, as far away from the courts as possible. Mm. Well, I think the courts appreciate it when they can see that there's been an attempt to go through some sort of mediation or you know negotiation before it's got that. Yeah, and that's why I think that's why I said that the, the code of conduct and the and the the um, uh, disciplinary board should always be in at the forefront of, of the mind of the architect when responding. So because if you uh, consider, if you presume that everything that you write to the client and say to the client is going to be have is going to have to be defended in front of an ARB disciplinary hearing then you've given yourself the best chance of not having to be in front of an ARB disciplinary hearing and of also setting it up in a way that will probably resolve it. Well, obviously, the first, the, the first point here is you have to have the right contract, which is clear, simple and understandable yeah. by your client in small practice. And if you start with that, at least you've got something to talk about. Mm. And if you don't have that, how do you get that clarity? I can see things diminishing. And if I mean, I very sadly read the ARB... Um, notifications of all these terrible cases. It's amazing how many people don't have proper forms of appointment with their client and uh, end up in disputes because there's, there's no clarity. Hmm. You've got to start with clarity and then you've got to do the communication. And I'm very happy to say that on top of this, what we've heard from you, Barbara, this morning is not just about communication with your client and your team, but also in-house, within your practice, and having a culture where you are open and transparent in exactly the same way as you want to be with your client. And I think mm -hmm. that's a very nice way for us to finish this discussion. So I'd just like to thank our panellists for today. Dieter, Mark, Nigel and Barbara, thank you very much for your contributions. And if you want any more information about these contracts, please go to ribacontracts.com. Thank you very much. <laughs>